G'day, g'day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another cracking edition of Investing in the US podcast from Los Angeles. I'm your host, Reed Goosens. Good as always to have you with us on the show. Now, it is 2018. It's going to be a huge year. I'm so glad all my loyal listeners have tuned in so that you can learn from my incredible guests and hopefully these guests inspire you to go out and take massive amounts of action. As you know, there's absolutely no BS on this show. We get straight into the nuts and bolts. And if you do like this show, you can please give us a review on iTunes and you can follow me wherever you podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher and Google Play. But you can also find these episodes up on my YouTube channel. So head over to readgoosens.com and click on the video link and it'll take you straight to the recordings of these podcasts each and every week. You can see my ugly mug, but you can see the beautiful faces of my guests. So today in the show, I have the pleasure of speaking with James Kandasami. And James is the founder of Achieve Investment Group, which is an award-winning multifamily syndication company based in Austin, Texas. Since 2015, James has acquired three large apartment communities totaling over 340 units in Central Texas. He runs the company with his, his wife and himself. They rehab, they manage, and they acquire all of this stuff in-house. And I failed to mention that he also did his MBA in sunny Adelaide in Australia. So we have a lot of common, common ground in there, but enough out of me. I'm excited to have him on the show. James, welcome to the show. How are you doing today, mate? Hey, I'm doing very well. Thanks for having me. You know, happy to be talking to you and your audience. Uh, mate, it's, it's great to have you on the show. I'm, I'm been, it's, we've been communicating for some time now, being that you're originally, yep. you've got a bit of time spent in Australia. But um, my first question I always ask my, my guests is, Rewind the clock and tell me how you made your first ever dollar. First ever dollar, probably before working, right? I mean, before fin before starting to work, I was studying, and even studying, I was always being trying to be uh, trying to do some business. And I was trying to write some uh, workbooks for my for my peers to mm -hmm. do physics, math, uh, you know, math practices, and I was trying that. And while studying, uh, I was always doing some internship, right? So that's where I make most of my first time money. And mm -hmm. after that, I become a, an engineer at a large semiconductor company, started in Malaysia and came to the US. And also I studied in the uni, uni SA, right? In South <laughs> Adelaide, right? So that was cool. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. I've been an engineer. Now I'm into real estate right now, commercial real estate. And you know, my story until now. Nice, man. Well, I'm so glad to get you on the show to talk about that. And that's what we, we like to hear the story behind everyone's journey, right? So maybe walk me through how, where you come from and how did you get to the United States? Well, I mean, uh, came from Malaysia originally. Uh, we, we, were, we were working with a large semiconductor company with another presence here in the US. And I was hired here to solve a problem over here. I mean, they need someone who's really good with... Uh, uh, project management. James, can you just hold on 30 seconds? Sorry, mate. My dogs are barking in the background. I'm going to go kick him in the... <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. No problem. Hey. Hey. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Sorry about that, mate. Oh, gosh. Uh, no problem. No problem. I, I put my dog in a small room so she <laughs> disturb me. <laughs> so let's 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 start that again. It's still okay. recording. That's okay. Sure. Um, so let's do it again. <clears throat> so Laura, if you're listening, we need to cut this the part out. So, so James, <laughs> rewind the clock and take us all the way back to where you made your first ever dollar. So my first. So a dollar was, uh, I mean, before I started working, while I even when I was studying, I was always trying to be, you know, in business, trying to do something to sell to others. And I was writing some of the physics book and trying to sell to my peers and uh, during my uh, summer, uh, summer holidays. So, and, you know, while working, I was always trying out different jobs. Whenever there's a break, I always do, you know, some jobs, you know, just to make money, right? So, and after working, I got a degree in electrical engineering. Mm -hmm. And I also did an MBA in uh, uh, University of South uh, Adelaide in, in Australia. So, 
um, become an engineer and uh, been doing engineering for 20 years and right now doing real estate. And that's where I am right now in real estate. Fantastic. Well, most of the people I get on my show, uh, you know, we want to know more about you, the man behind the success, right? So to walk us through how you made your transition yeah. here to the United States uh, and where did you come from originally, may, may I ask? So I came from Malaysia. So, uh, I, I, so I started there as an engineer and I worked there almost 15, 16 years, I think 15 years. And then I moved to the United States within the same company. You know, they needed some help over here. And I also want to come here too as well to, to explore the opportunities in the US. Uh, but I came through the company and um, came here and solved the problem that they had over here in one of the department. And after that, moved to another semiconductor company and um, you know, that's how I came from Malaysia to the United States. Right, right. And tell me a little bit more about how you, you studied your MBA in Radelaide, as they love to call it, in South Australia. What, why, okay. why, 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 why South Australia? Well, they had a really good program over there. I like the um, um, I like the program structure over there, and uh, Australia is so nearby, right? And mm-hmm. uh, you know, we were able to get uh, get into the program. We really liked the program and continued over there, graduated over there, and you know, moved back to Malaysia. So fantastic! And how long ago was that? Were you in Aussie? <sighs> that was probably. Um, Maybe ten years ago, maybe. Wow! wow. wow. You, <laughs> yeah, you traveled all over the world, mate. It's 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 incredible. We're Malaysia, Australia, and now here in the United States. And were you yes. always based in Texas when you first moved here? No, I moved to Oregon first. I was okay. in Portland, Oregon, and from Oregon went back to Malaysia and came back to Austin within wow. the same company. So, yeah, they needed some help in in Austin, and that's where you know I came in and stayed on in Austin, and I love it here in Texas. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. and so what inspired you to get involved in real estate investing? Obviously, you had a fantastic, you've got a fantastic, did have a fantastic job. Mm-hmm. And now, what was what was the yearning desire inside you to to take that next step and start, you know, essentially becoming an entrepreneur? Well, I mean, I always look for something to do other than my business. And while working in engineering, I was trying to do you know, all sorts of business. And one of the business I really tried was trying to do an online education program and mm-hmm. me and my wife used to work every night every night we spent like two or three hours trying to do build this program and we had developers in india and we were trying to do syllabus and we were hoping to do this you know, math practice business a success and every time i do that i realized that it's not going to be successful so there's always some company out there doing it much better than me putting in a lot more capital compared to you know me and my wife trying to do mm-hmm. from home right so so there was I know it's not going to work and um, I was always exploring this rental business and um, and when I did rental business, I mean, if you just buy a normal house and just do amortization and just pay down your loan and if you rent out, you minus off the expenses, you minimum, you'll get 9% return, which is a really good return, right? right. For, for any business, right? While working, King, if you buy a house, you can get minimum 9%. This is like 2000 in Austin. So still, I think, um, but I think uh, what triggered me was uh, when one day when my boss came and talked to me and told me that, uh, James, you have to work for another 16 years. I said, why? Oh, because you have three kids and all of them have to go to college. <laughs> and I didn't realize how expensive college is in the US <laughs> until, I, until that discussion. In, in Malaysia, I'm sure even in Australia, it's not that expensive, right? With 5,000 US dollars, you'll finish a, a full four-year engineering degree. Wow. Right? So, incredible. I mean, that was in Malaysia, right? So, it was really cheap and we really don't really look at, we don't really save up money for education for the kids because it's not that expensive, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll figure out something. But in the US, it's like, you need like 200,000, 300,000. And I was, I, I got a aha moment there and I said, wow, I need to go and figure out something. I need to do something different from my job if I want to fund the education, right? I mean, I mean, they may get scholarships and all that, but you can't really, you can't really rely on that, right? So, right. so I was looking at, you know, real estate and uh, I, I, I joined a group, a mentoring group where we started with single family houses. We bought like 13 houses. Uh, actually, we bought, uh, we bought 13 houses. Two of it was flipped. 11 was rental. After we do that two flip, we promise not to do any more flips. <laughs> so, 
out of that 11 houses, uh, you know, we got, uh, we, we, did, we did something called double closing where mm -hmm. you take uh, one property and put it into hard money lending and you refinance it into a, a conventional uh, Fannie Mae lending, which basically reduces your cash out of pocket. Um, so because of that strategy, you know, the last six houses, out of 11 houses, the first five, we, we did put out some money, maybe like 6,000 per door. But the last six houses uh, were almost zero cash out of pocket just because of strategy. Then I realized, wow, if you could do this strategy all the time, you can keep on building real estate and building your net worth, right? Continuously, right? And, um, and start, later start moving on to commercial real estate on apartments and try to do the same strategy again. Wow, fantastic. Right? So, and that's, that's awesome. Keep going. I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah, so... Once coming to multifamily, I see it's much bigger money. You know, we, we know we have like huge equity. We have almost like $400,000 of equity in single family. And we mm -hmm. refinanced all our houses, what, three, four times to just to take out cash and keep on buying. So it's a good strategy if you want to build single family, but single family is so much of work. I mean, <laughs> I mean, taxes, yeah, you pay at the end of the year, but insurance, if you see insurance, like it falls in every month and you have to like struggle to renew, renew the insurance policies mm -hmm. and tenant management is so much of work. And we know we have to get it to um, multifamily soon. Right. right. So, right, right, right. so that's where we start looking at multifamily and, and we, we know this buy, reposition, uh, refinance and rent strategy works even mm -hmm. in single family and also multifamily. So much so in multifamily is much more easier for it to work because you can force appreciate the property value right. by putting in, you know, your own hard work. Right. So that's the power of multifamily and we have been doing very well in it. Well, mate, you've got, I've got so many questions to ask you because you yeah. have got such an incredible experience and array of experience to come in, go through the single family jobs to do some flipping, uh, realize the power of building that equity up, building that nest egg, and then applying the same philosophy to commercial real estate. I think that's really powerful. And also having the, the where for all, you know, it sounds like you and your wife are an absolute hustlers because you're, you're doing yeah. the, the online course and it didn't work. And then you, you know, trying different things. And I think that's, it's a real uh, nod of the hat or a tip to the hat to you because it shows you just how, or shows the, the listeners just how hard you have to work at different yes. things before you find your niche or what you're really good at or what you're passionate about. And, you know, all that good stuff about creating businesses, but real estate is a business in itself and understanding the ins and outs of it. So you've, you've gone through the journey of, of, of learning the, the, the nuts and bolts of the business, of, of flipping, of, of buying houses. How did you go about buying that first multifamily property? So the first multifamily property, I mean, I have to trace back to my single family uh, roots as well, because the way I was able to get houses so cheap, uh, I mean, to do this double closing strategy, you have to get houses at a good, you know, below certain percentage of after repair value. Mm -hmm. So I think in San Antonio, where I used to buy, if you, if you buy below 66% ARV, which is after repair value, you almost get zero out of pocket. Mm -hmm. If you do a double closing between hard mm -hmm. money lender and San percent normal 30 year amortization and so so we tried so the way we have able to find all these houses is through our you know marketing effort we market direct to sellers i mean you can't go and buy from uh, agents or from mls and you'll get all the normal deals right mm -hmm. so so to be different you have to do different stuff right to make really good money to make to you have to be a you know, thinking out of box so what we did is we start uh, marketing direct to house owners, absentee owners out of state, and we, we try to do all things. And we learned through different, different podcasts, you know, bigger pockets. We learned a lot of things from there on how to market direct to sellers and buy the houses uh, really, at really, really good prices. So, so we took that methodology we use in single family and moved that on to multifamily. So I know at multifamily, it's not easy to start. Everybody's, everybody's crazy about multifamily. Everybody want right. to get a deal, but... You know, for newbies, it's so hard to get started, right? I mean, mm -hmm. um, who's going to talk to you, right? You are a newbie and mm -hmm. the inventory is so low. And this is, you're talking about multi-million dollar properties, right? Which broker is going to risk their commission to give it to a newbie who may not close, right? So, so after looking for two, three months, I, I mean, I talked to one broker. You can see from their voice on the phone, they are, li they are listening to you, but they're not really listening to you <laughs> because they know they don't want to waste their time. <laughs> so, so I said, okay, let me try. I marketing direct to sellers in multifamily. So that's where we started our 
our marketing campaign, uh, letter campaign, our phone, you know, cold calling and texting as well. So we use, mm -hmm. uh, we use text blasters to do that. And we did that for like almost two or three months continuously. And finally I got a, I got some seller who said, Hey, why not? Let's talk about this. I have a property that one of my friend, which I'm a partner is, he want to sell, you know, let's talk to that. And when I talk, so that's where I was able to talk to the agent in that small, uh, who, 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 uh, who works for this uh, owner who owns the 45 units. And uh, it was a very weird conversation. The first phone call between three of us, me, the agent and the owner. And you know, the owner was like, why am I talking to you? I want to sell, but you know, I really don't want to sell. I don't know why I want to talk to you. Somebody who I do not, not know, right? So that's where your empathy comes in. That's where your communication skills comes in. You know, how you talk to them. And they need to sell. They're under a lot of stress because the property management companies are not doing a good job and they do not know what to do with it. And they're not really in multifamily uh space they are in land development space so they're big mm -hmm. big they are big brokers in land development so these are not mom and pop trying to sell the house they are big guys but their niche is different so they say they love the land because you know there's no tenants on top of it you don't have to track the expenses you don't track the income you just buy it they appreciate it and they sell right mm -hmm. so they love that and they just want to get out from multifamily so they get they let me give uh, give it a shot to buy this first 45 units multifamily. It was a really good experience because first time you're doing it, you're looking at PNL because you know they're going to send you raw PNL, right? When you talk direct to sellers, you know they don't have this beautiful operating memorandum. Um, is it called operating? It's called offering yeah. memorandum. Offering right? memorandum. So yep, yep. They don't have this beautiful. There's no uh, brokers to tell you all the beautiful story about the property. There's no selling in between. So they just. I just said, give me the plan. And first time I looked at it, how do I read this, right? So it took me almost a week to really digest the p &L. It took me a week to look at the rent roll and look at the, the uh, growth, the, the value add on the project and try to understand it very well before I said, okay, this looks like a, a good deal. And, and I got that deal almost at 35 a door, uh, if I remember correctly. Wow. And, and yeah, it, well, when I first analyzed it, I'm a newbie, right? I, if I, if you do not know how to dissect a PNL, you wouldn't know. You wouldn't know. You wouldn't know how to look for the value adds, right? So I think it's very important for any newbies to know how to read the PNL very well. Even Robert Kiyosaki said, right, you have to look at the PNL. You have to be a master how to read PNL to know the story right. about the property. So once I do that, I'm able to see the value, and now I can see 35 a door was was a really good price because I know at that time in San Antonio, everybody was buying at 50, 55 a door, mm -hmm. and they were doing deals fine. Everybody was fine. Everybody was happy. And I was thinking, why this 35, you know, per door deal did not work until I realized that I'm doing all the mistakes in my PNL studies. And so, and so what, what sort yeah. of mistakes were you identifying, or what when you when you first sat there for that that week? How did you know mm -hmm. what mistakes to look for? And I guess, did you train yourself or well, did someone teach you? Well, I says, uh, well, I mean, I had, a, I had a mentor to tell me what to look for, right? But he was not there to look at this PNL. But I mean, you have to look at detailed expense report on what are they including, right? Are they including cap, CapEx into it or not? So mm -hmm. after three, four days looking, digging deeper, and then I realized, okay, they're including all the CapEx as, as an expense, which right. is not what we do on how we look for NOI, right? So... Mm -hmm. Then I have to export into an Excel. I have to pull that out from the normal operating expense and just keep the operating expense, keep the income. And now I can see the, the NOI, the true NOI that's going to give a value to the property. Mm -hmm. That's where then I start getting an, a lender to underwrite it. I mean, since it's off market, nobody's behind me, right? Nobody's really pushing me and all that. And, and uh, I had all the time in the world to really underwrite it well then the lender told me yeah this is a good deal you should do it so that's <laughs> it. so now okay me and him agree and we are able to say yeah let's go and do it right so so did you get what type of financing did you get on the property uh out of the gate because at 35k a door obviously it had some some, some major upside so did you go to a local community bank or did you go to a freddie and fanny uh, yeah because debt? i know so when i did that underwriting i know there's a lot of upside in the deal and I always want to reposition the property and refinance the money out of whatever we invested because that's the best uh, strategy, I would say. Right? Once you take out your everybody's money out, your risk is almost less. right? You don't have any money in the deal. Your IRR shoots up. You can take that money and go and invest somewhere else. So, so what I said is I'm not going to do an agency loan. I'm going to do a, a, 
uh, what you call a small bank loan. Mm -hmm. So I think I believe I got like 4.25% wow. for three years fixed, one year of IO, 80% loan. Wow. So, so loan, I know with 80% Loan to cost actually, or loan to value? Uh, loan to cost. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah, they, I mean, most companies give you 80% loan to cost. Yeah, they don't give you loan to value because that'll be too much. Because we were 50, we, we, the property appraised 50% more from the money we put in. So day one itself, <laughs> we already got 50% additional money. So if mm -hmm. you have invested 100,000, day one on your closing, your 100,000 becomes 150,000. Of course, on paper. So, but... It's it's a huge uh, it's a huge addition to your net worth and, and your confidence as well, right? So, so I believe we put in one point five. Uh, uh, no, I think the loan was one point five. We wanted thirty thousand down, and we were able to get the deal done. And from thirty five a door in twelve months, we worked really hard. This was the first deal. Me and my wife was like, you know, first three months, you know, the, the occupancy always drops. Every property we buy. Drops. In general, because we're buying a value at deals, it drops, right? So from <laughs> 90, we were, we were 90 dropped to like 70 something the first wow. two months. And we were like, wow, let's, because we are like putting in a lot of policies in, in the place. And we run our property manager. We try to, it's, a, it's called training the tenant, right? Once you mm -hmm. train the tenant, some tenants can't take it. They just leave. So that's okay. The bad one, let them go first. So, <laughs> so we were rehabbing. We were turning around the properties. It went down to 77 in two months and start picking back up in uh, Another two more months, we're back at 90. Once we mm -hmm. start finishing like five to six units. So within 12 months, uh, we bought it at 35 a door. In 12 months, uh, the property was appraised at 58 a door. Wow. That's so fantastic. it went from um, 1.5 million to 2.8 million in 12 months. That's great. That's great. Yeah. And so did you have, did you get investors involved in that or did you just yeah. do the money out of, your, out of your own pocket? No, we had like five investors out of mm -hmm. that. And um, yeah, we had like five investors who, you know, were involved. Passive investor with me, but me and my wife was running the show. Fantastic. And so yeah. mm -hmm. tell me, that's back in 2015. That's your first ever yeah. deal. What are you yeah. doing today to find deals? Obviously, the deals like that where you're picking up for $35,000 a door and 12 months later, they've, you've doubled your investors' money. Those types of deals aren't as prevalent. So are you looking harder? Are you looking at more different markets? Wait, has your has your, your finding strategy changed at all? What are you doing to keep ahead of the game and make sure you're buying a great deal? Yep. So I think for the for the newbies, you have to work hard and you have to find, you know, you have to find ways to think out of the box to get the first deals done. So my first two deals I did using the same method, and one was 45 and the other one was 174. Both came at great prices. But I'm also realizing it's a lot of work, mm -hmm. right? To to do that, you know, a lot of marketing, and it's it's really, really a lot of work. So, but as you grow up on your number of units, you know, you want to go 200, 300 units. You know, now, um, you know, I do not know whether yellow letter marks. Well, I start doing it. I mean, it works. I mean, they do. Have, they are people calling it, but I can't get it to closing. So I start uh, networking with brokers. Right now, with the two deals on my belt, under my belt, brokers have a lot more respect to me, right? With me, mm -hmm. right? Because they know this guy have closed. He owns the property in the local market. So they have a lot more, I have a lot more credibility. So now it's much easier for brokers to bring the deals to me. So, um, so but now primarily using networking brokers because yeah, they're going to come and give you a lot of deals, right? And you have to keep on underwriting deals to find the value inside any each of these deals. Right. I don't think so most of the, any of the deals is going to be just like give it to you and you're going to get a good deal. You have to look for value. You have to look at, two years down the road, what is the value that you can create? Mm -hmm. uh, the deals where you get just cheap is no more available. And it's, it's not going to be available from brokers because brokers are the branch that's going to neutralize that. The, the I mean, sometimes sellers want to sell cheap, but because of brokers are there and brokers need to pitch their mm -hmm. position to the seller saying that I can give, give you a good deal, give the listing to me they're going to jump up, they're going to bump up the price and the price is going to come to a certain level where the market is right now. Right. Right. So, yeah. So, so broker deals are not going to be the cheapest deal. Most of the time, it's going to be very, very rare to find a really, really cheap deal, but you can find deals with good value add. And if you know how to look for value and if you're able to, if you're a master value adder, you know, you know how to rehab and you know how to fix property management. 
you can go down and take down that kind of projects and you know that's where i think the value comes in and that's where you can find good deals right so talk to me about on and i love just before we get off that topic i love the fact that how you become become so creative in the way that you went from you know yellow letters and marketing directly to sellers to now building your network out of, of, of brokers and, and people who are, who are wanting to give you deals because you've, you've performed. And I think for everyone listening out there, it's mm-hmm. so important as a newbie investor to show that you can perform, right? And that once you've got a skin on the, on the wall, they're going to keep coming back to you again and again. Correct. So they need a closer. Right. They do need a closer. So <laughs> you mentioned that brokers are sort of now the bottleneck of where to get great deals from. So are you, have you completely stopped your yellow letters uh, in finding those cracking deals or are you still doing that a little bit? Well, right now I've completely stopped. Yeah. Because I think it's, it's it takes a lot of time and I, I, mm-hmm. I think I get a lot more traffic from brokers right now and I'm, I'm a bit comfortable with the traffic that's coming in and I can choose one and, and still do it. And, and I still look for really, really good deals even if it comes from brokers. So mm-hmm. I'm not just not going to buy whatever they're going to give me. Right. So, and they know that we are experienced indicators. So when they come to us, they know what to, what to expect from us, but we also can give them feedback very quickly. Right. So they're happy with that. So, so the, the volume of people giving deals become higher because the brokers are involved right now and they are able to feed it to you and you have the opportunity to choose on right. which uh, deal to come. Right. Although I would say you probably, if I go back to my yellow letter and, and, uh, and, uh, tax blaster phone i think you can still find a deal that's fantastic probably because uh you know i'm just no more doing it yeah <laughs> yeah yeah so i'm sure i'm sure you can still find a deal you can find one guy but it might take like one year you know right. one great deal so, it, and it takes a period of time to you know put that mindset and that energy and the effort into doing that sort of strategy in order to reap reap rewards right um yeah so talk to me yeah, about right. that that with all, in this market of compressed cap rates and all that sort of stuff how are you looking for that value what are specific things that advice you can give to newbie guys out there listening to this show thinking okay i want to take down a deal but there's compressed cap rates and everyone talks about entry cap rates and exit cap rates and where can i be smart when i look at that PL? So I don't look at entry cap rate at all because a lot of times a property management company are not managing the property to the maximum potential. So mm-hmm. since we have our own property management company and, and we have done huge rehab, right? The second deal we did like one and a half million dollar rehab. We won the San Antonio property of the year award for best rehab, you know, beating all these big company like Greystone, Capstone and all that. So we know rehab pretty well. Um, so we are able to look at, we are able to do rehabs much more efficiently. Um, and that's one option. The other option is to look at the property management aspect of it and see where are they not doing very well and see how you can go and fix it. And you're not going to see it at the entry cap rate because entry cap rate is how the current guys are running the show, right? The current right. sellers are running it. They, they, have, they may have a good property management company, but most of the time they're not that good. So, so since we have our own property management company, we know the best known methods on how to you know, uh, milk out the efficiency from mm-hmm. the operation. We can project like when we take over, you know, how much um, cap rate improvement that we're going to do, how much NOI we're going to increase. So we look at it that way. We look at it one to two years down the road. How, what are the values that I can add in? Right. right? To rehab, to increase rent or to reduce expenses or through some creative finance, you can do a lot, a lot of kind of things of value add. And that's where we try to go for that kind of deal where we can put in our own um, uh, creative thinking to uh, improve the NOI. Mm-hmm. So when you do look at that PL, is there an example you can give to our listeners to say, okay, if they're bloated on a specific line item that you know, just for example, that you see it, it's a common thread through these properties because of poor management. So are there any examples that you can give? Well, one of one of it is, of course, the rubs. I mean, rubs. I'm not talking about just you know re- reallocating to water or reallocating the electric. Like, pretty do that, right? But if you look at rubs percentage, I mean, there is a certain max you can do. You can do like 95 percent on a non-irrigation type of apartment, right? So, but if you look at the property management, they're probably collecting 70 percent. Mm-hmm. So that's one way you have to figure out why are they not collecting high enough, right? Because that's like 20 percent rubs collection that can improve your bottom line by like, you know, one or 2%, right? In, in mm-hmm. the rough section. So that's one thing. I mean, rehab, of course, you can rehab it, you know, reduce your loss to lease. You can do that. That's pretty standard, right? You can rehab, you improve the rent, 
Um, so Rubs is one thing. You can look at their marketing budget. A lot of this property management company, they go and advertise in apartments.com, foreign.com, Zillow, Hotpads. You know, every one of that advertisement costs you like $500. So their marketing budget is like $3,000, right? So, but when we run ours, we look at the best two guys or best one guy and we just advertise in them because most of the time the renters are going to look at one website. Mm-hmm. But they have this, you know, they have this package deal that they do with all these companies and they do, they just give it to them. And, you know, it's a lot of inefficiencies in terms of marketing. Right. Um, and, you know, you can always use your own property manager to advertise in Craigslist and, you know, be a good uh, marketer itself to make sure that occupancy is up. So marketing is, I always seen is pretty high uh, contract services. You have to go and renegotiate all the contracts that yeah. you put in because I'm, I bet you when you renegotiate, you're going to get much better terms. A lot of property management company does not negotiate their contracts. Once they put in, they just forget about it because they are big companies, right? They have mm-hmm. regionals who's managing like nine to 10 and regionals are the one who are a bit more smarter guys in that, in that group. How can they look at PNL? Uh, whereas the property managers are just going to be the people who are working on the uh, property, right? Yep. And if you look at property management compensation, right? It's a flawed model. When I say flawed model is we as investors, we care about NOI and mm-hmm. NOI is income and expenses. Right. But property management are paid only on income, <laughs> right? So it's a flawed model. They don't care about expenses. So they do very well in income because they're going to get, you know, 3% or 4% out of it, but they don't really care about the income, but we really care about it, right? So right. As, a, as an investor, owner, manager, we are going to care about both, but they are going to care just about the income. So, so if you look at a lot of expense ratio, a lot of it's like, pretty high or wasted and you can really get two or three percent cash and cash out of uh, any investment if you go and be more efficient in that right squeeze so, squeeze, squeeze the, the 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 gears as they say and like really exactly squeeze the juice out of it you now i know what exactly, you're saying yeah yeah so so yeah. With, the, with all those sort of negotiating tactics um mm-hmm. typically what are you seeing as an ex, a rule of thumb for those mm-hmm. people out there analyzing uh taking notes mm-hmm. <laughs> when you can take over a property and then once you get it stabilized, what's your approximate ratio of expense to income? I've seen time and time the most efficient you know, for 200 and units and below. Uh, I think if you come down to 45, 60 units and below, your ratio most efficient operation would be almost at 55, 56%. And once you go above 100 to 200, your most efficient ratio will be almost at 50%. And when you go above 200 to, to 300, your most efficient ratio will be like 48 to 49% of expense yep. ratio. So yep. that'll be your most uh, optimal operation, right? And um, I'm sure you can do better than that. It's just whenever I write my under performer, that's what I'm seeing. Most efficient operation with, with our own staff running the show, with our own uh, insurance, you know, uh, with our own con. Uh, I mean, we negotiated the contracts, we are doing rubs, you know, you, I think 50% would be a good uh, benchmark. Uh, good benchmark, yeah. 200 to 300. Yeah. And I think, yeah. did you just so that, if you're running like 55, you're, you're a bit more. Right. And, and I think that range of, saying, of 50 to 60%, you know, good rule of thumb, 55%, particularly if you're looking for a stabilized uh, product. Um, mm-hmm. So, and it goes back to, I love what you, your point you said before, which was, looking at the ingoing cap rates and so many investors look at those ingoing cap rates and think, Oh gosh, I can't, I can't, I don't like look, it's too low or or whatever. It's just like, if you don't understand the fact that that particular asset manager or or property manager are running it so inefficiently, Mm -hmm. cap rate is related to NOI. Now, if the NOI is low, then the cap rate's low, right? It doesn't mean that you can't get the cap rate up to, you know, a, a six or six and a half by year two or year three. So personally, mm-hmm. and I don't know how you feel about this. I look at the ingoing cap rate and that's all well and good, but then I look mm-hmm. at the stabilized cap rate after two years and see Correct. what that is. And that is really more and more of a litmus test to say, okay, this is where what the property really could be performing at in two years time. Would you agree with that? statement? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's not, a, yeah, I, I, I definitely look at that because the improvement from the current cap rate when you're buying it and to the two years, Performa stabilize is what your value that you're creating. That's the upside. Right. So to give an example, I was looking at a deal yesterday and I was buying, uh, you know, it was a deal that we can buy at 6.8% cap rate, sorry, 6.4% cap rate. That's how they're running in T12. It's a, it's a super efficient uh, operation. When I look at the PNL, they're really mm-hmm. efficient. 
But when we take over on day one with our expenses, it's going to be 7.4% cap rate. And when I take the current NOI, the new NOI on day one after we take over, you know, divide with the day zero cap rate, mm-hmm. you get you get um, a value increase of almost one million dollars. Wow! So just just because of your operation, right? so how do you, how do you becoming... two years? What are you going to be getting? <laughs> right. right. So how are you becoming so much more efficient than these other guys out there? Is it because you have in-house property management and you can afford to be more efficient? Well. Well, they could be, I mean, uh, they could be using third-party property management. They have uh, staff's uh, costs, right? And sometimes the staff, if you want to run a property management company, you can pay them. You can pay a lot of benefits and perks, right? And all that adds up, right? Uh, so we 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 have our own uh, staff. We give good benefits to our staff as well. But it's all still much better than a lot of companies giving uh, out there. It's just much more... Um, efficient aligns to their performance. We'd like to give bonuses instead of getting them super high pay and super high benefits. And you know, all that is not going to help you in the bonus. And, and they are happy. They get a lot of uh, off days and all that. So our staff uh, cost is much cheaper. Hmm. And, and uh, keep in mind when I talk about 50% and uh, you know, when we run it, I'm talking about taxes, the property taxes to be at pro forma level. So I'm right. assuming like hundred percent tax. Right, uh, and that's where you need to look at fifty percent expense ratio. If you take the pro forma tax and your your own expense ratio, you should be getting total fifty percent expense ratio. Oh, I completely agree. And I think the big thing about just chatting with you is just getting familiar and getting comfortable with diving into the P and L. And I guess for all those people out there who are listening and just understanding that the ingoing cap rate is it's a litmus test. But it's not the be-all to end-all. And I think there's a lot of investors out there personally that I've dealt with that look at like, oh, the ingoing cap rate's at 5%. It's like, yeah, but in two years' time, we're going to get it to over a 6, and 6, 6.5. Like that's what you need to be looking at. Uh, where where they, they don't necessarily see it like that. And so it's about, as a syndicator, it's about educating them on that process of where the value is and how you can become and go and turn those knobs on, on that big machine to make it more efficient, right? Yes, yes, correct. I think one of the big problems that we see in a lot of multifamily education is a lot of people are learning to be asset, asset managers, but they're forgetting the aspect of property managers, property mm-hmm. management, right? So to find efficiencies in PNL or inefficiency in PNL, you have to know the property management aspects of it. So when I look at a PNL, I can tell whether this operation is efficient or wastage or not, right? But if you're just learning the asset management side of it, if you're just you know, learning the raising money, doing syndication, that is, that is the easy part. Nowadays, it's easy to find money. There's a lot of capital chasing for that small number of deals. And if you know how to analyze your deals very well, that small number, you can find germ, gems in that small number of deals. You can find deals, really good deals in that small number of deals. But you have to learn the property management aspect. You have to learn each line item. And, and because a lot of people are just being taught asset management and everybody's thought to learn that just give it to that third third party guys and go on i mean as i said market is very strong right now people are not worried about property management Mm -hmm. but when the market goes down property management becomes very critical and they are going to be like scrambling and you can see whether how strong is the property management or how efficient is the property management companies right so so that's an important skills i think everybody have to learn and know how to underwrite each of the expense item you may not do the property management but i think you have to know how to underwrite each expense item and Every time property management companies send you a PNL and a budget, you can question them why is this, why is that, right? I mean, if you do not know, you're just going to be saying, yeah, I'm happy. And I'm just going to give returns. I mean, as I said, market is booming right now. You can get returns. But when the market turns, you know, then that's where, you know, you'll be like completely out of control. It's everything on property management. And that's going to be a really bad asset manager. So so what, what are you doing from an underwriting point of view, given the fact that, Say you don't have your your in-house property management, right? As an underwriter, what would you typically underwrite in San Antonio or in the in the, the state of the, the markets that you're in? A, a, an average price per door for expenses on a stabilized mm-hmm. asset. What it, you know, say if say it's a hundred units or more. So, uh, price per door is, it, it varies, right? I mean, you're talking about expense ratio, or you're Correct. just talking about would, price per door. In general? Price per door in general of you know of the operating expenses on a stabilized asset. You know, is it is it? Four yeah, it depends on 
it, yeah, it depends on the unit mix, right? So mm -hmm. price per door is a bit misleading because sometimes mm -hmm. some property has a lot more two bedrooms, three bedrooms, and that price per door might be higher versus mm -hmm. you know ninety percent one bedroom and the price per door is lower. Does I mean, so it, sometimes this price per door can confuse a lot of things. So I I do talk price per door, but I don't use it as a guideline. So but in general, if you have like eighty to 80, 75 to 80 percent one bedrooms, your price per door falls in like 4.8 per door uh, in terms of expense. And if you go like a slightly bigger, like a, you know, two, two more 50, 50, two bedroom versus mm -hmm. one bedroom, your price per door slightly goes up to like 5,000 uh, something. But it's, it's between that 4.8 to 5.1 right. range. Right. I think it doesn't go above that. Uh, yeah. And all this I'm talking about is with the pro forma taxes. That means hundred percent of mm -hmm. purchase price uh, assumed uh, property taxes. Top, multiplied by your mill rate for those people yes. out there. That, yeah. Correct, correct. Um, yeah. And, and 4.8 for all those people listening out there is, is four is $4,800 $4, per unit per year to, to 5,100 in that range that, that, that James is seeing. And that's for like a class C asset, correct? That's like a class C, yeah. It, it, you know, some, even class B would go into that level. Uh, but I've not done a lot of class B plus, but I've done B to C. Yeah, that's what I see right now. Yep. Yeah, that's fantastic. It's great, great intel because it's a lot of people out there are always scratching their heads going, what is that? And, and it varies from market to market. So, so if you're underwriting deals in San Antonio, it may differ from someone underwriting deals in North Carolina. So keep, keep that in mind when, when, you know, when people are listening out there and underwriting your deals. James, yeah, any exactly. advice you can give to those people who are just starting out like yourself What's the number one piece of advice, you know, to, to get your first deal done? Uh, think differently. Everybody knows real estate is hot right now. Everybody knows multifamily is good. You're not alone. So you have to think differently to get started, right? So look for deals off market. There's a lot of sellers who are willing to sell off market. Change your mindset. A lot of people think that there's no more deals out there and people say, I want to wait when you wait, when the market turns, I can bet you there's going to be another barrier to entry is going to come, right? It's the same thing, right? Everybody's going to be scared, right? Everybody thinks market's going to turn. Everything's going to say constant, just the multifamily property will, prices will go down. That's not going to be true. The whole economy is going to collapse, right? Where everybody's scared. So you can't buy it at that point of time, right? So, right. Right. so my advice is look for deals. I mean, I don't really like to go with market swings because that is uncertain, right? So I look mm -hmm. for deals with building upside. So right. any deals I look for, I know that there's a building upside that is not realized. I can put my sweat equity, I can put my expertise, my skills to, to capture that upside. And that is your equity capture, right? So when you do that, when you look for that kind of value add, uh, you know, deal with the building upside, you're not really worried whether the market going to turn or market going to be, you know, uh, going further or not. You're just going to get the benefit. Worst case market turn, you you still bought it at a good price with an upside. You get you get some upside, right? If market doesn't turn, you get uh, you get the benefit of appreciation. Right. Uh, but never buy deals which is um, which is uh, sell, sold at uh, market cap rate or market market rate right. because there's no value to add on top of it, right? I know I know everybody want to get started, right? Everybody want to do deals. We know that, right? But mm -hmm. Work hard, right? You know, I, th I think the biggest the biggest thing you're trying to say is look for that value. You know, there, there, there has to be there has to be something in there that the you know what our, our thesis right now is look for long term buyers that have 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 just you know maybe managed occupancy but haven't really pushed the rent. Now I can go in there and do fifteen to twenty percent rental bumps over mm -hmm. twelve to eighteen months. There's the value, right? And right. I'm looking for a lot, a lot of meat on the bone. So, mm -hmm. you know, people look at the entry cap rates versus exit cap rates, blah, 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 blah. It's about mm -hmm. understanding where the value is through right. what you've just said, which is, you know, um, the rents first and foremost, but also getting really efficient with your property management expenses um, and, right. and understanding the property management side. I think that's really, really key. And, and, and mm -hmm. for all those people listening out there, I go back, rewind this because this is exactly the type of piece of advice that is going to make you successful in 2018. So James, yes, we, we come to the end of the show. I love to ask my uh, guests uh, to give me their top five sure. investing tips. You ready to get into it? Sure. Go ahead. All right, mate. What is the daily habit you practice to keep on track towards your goals? 
uh, daily practice. Uh, I mean, I have morning rituals where I meditate and I visualize and of course journaling. Uh, that's very important to clear your mind, I would say. Um, once I do that, of course, uh, you know, always look at deals, network with uh, brokers and network with even with passive investors. You always have to keep on looking for passive investors. I think... I, mate, uh, just putting the business to one side of it, I think the, the getting your mindset right, the meditation, the mm -hmm. journaling is so important. Uh, yeah. I, you, know, you, you're a very, you seem like a very high functioning type of guy. I'm a very high, mm -hmm. high functioning type of guy as well. And I, I noticed a mm -hmm. huge change in the way that I approach my work when I took mm -hmm. 20, to, 20 minutes to half an hour of a morning focused on some deep breathing exercises, focused on getting mm -hmm. the, the chatter out of my head and onto a piece mm -hmm. of paper. What yes, I need to do, yes. like you're always constantly talking, Absolutely. talking, talking, Absolutely. talking, and you've got to just take a moment to say, turn off the phone, turn off the internet, turn off everything, and just breathe and focus mm -hmm. on the breathing. Get, get, the, get the clutter out of your head onto a piece of paper, and then be so much more relaxed when mm -hmm. you approach the day. And there's so many people out there that, you know, I find even in personally, because, it's just the first thing they do when they wake up in the morning is on the phone. The first thing they do is they're on their internet, they're on their, they're on their email and you're going to burn yourself out. Take time to work yeah. on yourself. And it's been so important and it's really helped me with, towards my success over the last couple of years. And I think that's fantastic to hear that you're doing exactly the same thing. So, so everyone listening out there, Absolutely. Take, take notes and start meditating. <laughs> Yeah, I think at the end of the day, I mean, I, I realized this uh, compared to a lot of people who started same time with me. Uh, it's all about the mindset, right? Mm -hmm. And and I'm also sometimes, you know, I, I say it about mindset, but sometimes I think, oh, there's no deals out there. But I try to train myself. No, no, there are deals out there. You have to go and look for it. Right, so right. You have to, it's, it's all about self-control. It's, it's a lot of it spiritual, right? It's, you, know, mm -hmm. you actually trying to realize your own potential in this world. Right, exactly. And, and, and this is just a journey to it, right? So at the end of the day, when you are like 70, 80 years old, and you're going to see whether you really, utilize all your potential as a human and mm -hmm. i believe that controlling your mindset towards achieving something and your real estate is just a tool right so right. so training your mindset i think is very important and and you have to believe there are deals out there absolutely <laughs> <laughs> i love it i love it man you, you're you're exactly the type of guy i want to talk to because of mindset you know meditation all that sort of stuff being focused yeah. on the fact that real estate is a tool to get you to financial freedom and and at the end of the day you want to be looking back on on your life and saying did i, did I live up to my potential you know so yeah. absolutely yeah. awesome yeah stuff. yeah i always think that what kind of stories can i tell my grandkids exactly. right i, mean, I don't want to buy an <laughs> I don't want to buy an average deal and average return and I did this. I want to say, yeah, I bought this deal. I turned and gave back 100% in 12 months, which I did two times. So, right. so that's like really, really something different where you can tell your grandkids and you right. want to be happy when you die, right? So. Exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so mate, what has been, who has been the most influential person in your career to date? Um, that's uh, probably my wife. I mean, oh, she has been right. controlling my mindset. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes, you know, I also uh, think that, hey, there's no deals or we didn't do well. She said, no, look at it. You have done this much, right? So she's a good support uh, and a pillar to me and to my success as well. I mean, we do it together, but as I said, mindset is important, but she's, she's really, you know, sometimes happy. I mean, she's, you know, there to caution me about my mindset as well. So I think that's important. Right. What is the most influential tool in your business that you, you know, whether it be software or physical tool, you know, um, uh, it might be a mobile phone. What, what tool do you have to make you, your business successful? I would say your, um, my Excel, Excel spreadsheet, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so I build my own Excel spreadsheet with looks for value add. And uh, I recently built a really good, Excel spreadsheet, which, you, which, which looks at two different mortgages because I like to refinance out and mm -hmm. continue keeping the property for long term. So I built a really good analyzing tool, uh, which I'm building a web tool as well. So once I put it into the web, you know, anybody can use it. So it's basically a tool where you're able to look for value and you're able to look at what's the value going to be for 10 years when you halfway refinance out your some of the cash. Because right mm -hmm. now, it's, it's difficult to do with just a normal Excel spreadsheet. You have to use multiple Excel spreadsheets and combine it. And it helps me to analyze my deals very quickly, especially right. value-add deals. 
Great. And it's great that you created a, a digital asset for your business in which you can go in there and quickly punch out a good, you know, and underwrite the deal and understand yeah. within a matter of hopefully seconds or minutes that you, yeah. do you have a good deal or not. So it's all about time management, right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's not really minutes. I mean, usually when I underwrite, I almost take like a, a one hour because I really want to look for details mm -hmm. in the deal. I mean, at least some, once I look at some deals and I'm not looking at hundreds of deals. So a lot of deals we just, doesn't you I don't even look at it but once they say value add and I know some some really good value add I start going a bit more detail into it Fantastic. So it almost take like an hour per, per deal right right <laughs> what is uh what's been the biggest failure in your career and what did you learn from that failure oh I think a lot of failures we learn in single family so that's why sometimes I feel we really hit it well with a single family because that's where we learn, you know, how to manage tenants, right? Mm -hmm. How to manage contractors because we were doing major rehabs. Uh, we were buying and repositioning. So the rehab can be like twenty, thirty thousand $30,000 rehab uh, in three months. You know? And uh, San Antonio was only like $100,000 per house at that point of time, right? So, so we were doing major rehab and we learned a lot on how to manage tenants, how to manage uh, contractors. We had contractors running away. We had, you know, tenants, uh, you know, skipping you know and and all all kind of lease issues so so there's no really big failures but i think all that is just learnings i mean mm -hmm. but all of it were done as part of the single family i mean in multi-family we are we we have learned a lot from single family and we are implementing it on multi-family right now fantastic fantastic mate where can people reach you to continue the conversation if you've given us some incredible pieces of, of information golden nuggets as i like to say but where if people want to reach out to, to continue the conversation ask you more questions about your underwriting what you do in your journey where can they go sure so they can go to Achieve Investment Group, my website, and my email is james at Achieve Investment Group. Achieve as in achieving a goal, A-C-H-I-E-V-E. -E. Achieve Fantastic. Investment Group. So I can be rich over there. Fantastic. Well, James, thank you for dropping by. Enjoy the rest of your week and we'll catch up soon. Well, there you have it. Thank you, Ray. My pleasure. I just want to quickly wrap up, uh, you know, summarize some of the great nuggets that I learned from today's uh, conversation with James. And some of the big takeaways were, you know, not, not getting so concerned with low cap rates going in un and, and understanding where the value is. And I think diving into the weeds of property management uh, as a whole and where you can save uh, expenses um, or line items expense. Uh, once you, you become your own property manager. And, and, and I think one of the, the key bits that James was talking about is that property management as a, as a third party is a flawed tool because they base their income, uh, base their profit on, their, on the income of the property, not necessarily the, the expenses that they save. So learn a, a fantastic amount from James. Uh, if you do want any of the show notes from today's show, please jump on my website at readgooses.com and you'll be, all the links will be up there that we discussed. Uh, and as I said, just click on the podcast link. Thanks again for taking some time out of your day to tune in to continue to grow your real estate investing knowledge because that's what we're all about here on this show, to continue to grow your financial IQ. And we're going to do this all again next week. So take care, be safe, and remember, happy investing. Investing.